Let's read Habakkuk chapter 1, Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, and I'll read through verse 11. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you look idly at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise, so the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Now, let me insert, in case your Bible doesn't say explicitly, beginning of verse 5, the Lord answers back. The Lord begins to speak in verse 5. And he says, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings, not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press, on, uh, press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings, they scoff, and at rulers, they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. This is the word of the Lord. I hope you would agree with me that uh, some, sometimes what God is doing is plain. It's clear. And sometimes it's mysterious. It's hidden. Because sometimes it seems God doesn't care. And we look out at the circumstances and our hearts can go to a place that perhaps he's done. Not completely, but he's done with us. I mean, do you ever... Have you ever prayed, God, if you are real? <laughs> I have. Um, or, God, if you really care, that's beginning to move into that category of maybe he's not and maybe he doesn't. Well, that's where Habakkuk was. And again, I think it's a perfectly fitting word for at least the American church in 2020. And so we cry out and we pray, God, why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you doing more to stop the dishonoring of your name? Why aren't you doing more to stop the violence? Why aren't you doing more to stop a nation from imploding, from destroying itself? Why aren't you doing more to stop this virus? Lord, why aren't you making it plain that you're still working? If we are, in fact, sheep, as you call us, and we are so easily distracted and discouraged, why don't you just make it plain for us? Because that's what we would do, right? <laughs> and so we just throw that back on God. Make it plain that you care for us, that you care for the righteous, and that you will and maybe already are doing something about all of the unrighteousness. Maybe your prayer is... God, why aren't you answering our prayer for revival? That's where Habakkuk was. That's the heart condition Habakkuk was dealing with. Some of the confusion that he was trying to wrestle through and make sense of. For some extended period of time, the prophet Habakkuk had been, had been weeping and screaming for the Lord, for Yahweh to act. We read of that in verses 2 through 4 last week. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you look idly at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed. Justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth. Perverted. Last week, we spent all of our time right there looking at this man, this prophet of God, crying out, but he's crying out as an act of faith. 
His crying is not the absence of faith. It is the, the, the right expression of faith. A brokenhearted, hurting prophet brought his pain to the Lord like a child, a confused child looking to a parent for help. And I noted then and I note again this morning that when it seems God does not care, we should go to the Lord to voice our concerns to the Lord. But then don't stop there. Don't knock the dust off your feet in the presence of the Lord. Voice, cry, and then be silent. Listen and humbly receive the word of the Lord. So last week was all about crying out as an as a act of faith. Crying out with outrage as an act of faith. And we need to be reminded, let's be outraged over the right things. Outrage is the spirit of the, of the age right now. That, that's what's defining so much of the public conversation. It's outrage on both sides. And I'm just simply saying in the name of Christ, let's be outraged. But let's just make sure it's over the right thing. Let's be broken hearted over the right things. So many American Christians are outraged right now. Because the country they love is under attack. And so many of those same American Christians are silent because the God they love, or as the God they love, is being slandered and dishonored. And they're not upset about that. They're not weeping over that. They're not staying up. They're not, they're not throwing fits, holy fits. God is being slandered. So many American Christians are fighting to preserve our nation, but at the expense of dishonoring God. Does that break our hearts? Does it, and and I, I, oh, I, I want an answer, but I understand that's not, this isn't the moment for it. But does it break our hearts? There are activities, and I'm saying our brothers, sisters, our activities... Dishonor the Lord? So many have given in to the battle plan of anger. Have given in to the battle plan of name calling, threats, insults, bullying, just shouting. It's, you know, cyberbullying doesn't just happen in high school. It happens in our church. Did you know that? I don't, I don't know if you know this or not, but I just want to share this. This is as a, as a shepherd word. If we are just talking about the social media platform called Facebook, if you're not on it, hallelujah. Stay off. But if you're on it, I don't know if you know this, but if we're friends, I see what you post. Did you know that? And so, for example, if I go to a, to a page on Facebook and I comment on the page, it's going to show up in your feed. Did you know that? That's why I say cyberbullying is not just in high school. It happens in our church. I see the threats. I, I see the underhanded practice. I see that... And we've been discipled by the world. What, what I'm getting at is search the scriptures high and low. Bullying is not the heart of our God. Harassing is not the heart of our Savior. It doesn't take the spirit of the living God to be mean, to be snarky, to be short, to be dismissive. Yeah, you may have the self-control not to physically flip the middle finger to people, but sometimes your words do. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. I feel like I just forgot one. I don't remember. Self-control. 
irony, self-control. And I want to say this, hear me, it says the fruit, not the fruits of the Spirit. You don't get to take this one and throw out the other. I got that fruit, but not that. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. And the Spirit is doing all of that in His people. And you don't get one and toss out the other. If you toss out one, you've tossed them all out. It's singular. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and here we go, self-control. That's the evidence that the Spirit of God lives in us and is leading us. That should be our, our, our heart. That should be our posture. That should be the way we interact with one another and with the world. Not shouting, not bullying, not threatening, not insulting. Now, I am all for fighting for the United States of America. I think you remember, I too served in the United States Army. And at least in that moment of time, I was willing to die for this great nation. I'm all for fighting for our nation. I'm simply saying fighting to preserve a nation is not, is not, is not the church's charter. Our fight is against the darkness by being disciples that make disciples of Jesus for the glory of God alone. That's our mission. That's our calling. That's why we exist. That's why Black Mountain Baptist Church is on this spot of land. That's what Jesus shed his blood for. So I want to ask, and I want us to wrestle through this, not just today, but in these coming months, probably in the next few years. What will it profit if we win the nation while millions within our nation die and, and go to hell? What will be the profit? Only one banner is going to fly lead. Only one message can lead. So if we win, whatever that means, and we preserve our great nation, but do so by speaking and acting in ways that are contrary to Christ, that distract from his gospel. Honestly, what is the win? Someone, someone said to me, I think it was this past week, maybe the week before, but just wisely reminded me. You'll probably guess who it is as I say this, if you know him. At the end of the day, there are only two types of people. Those who know Christ and those who don't. Those that will die and perish forever in hell are those that will be united with Christ and worship him forever. That's very clarifying and it's sobering and it's correcting. So if we win and preserve the nation, but do so by acting in ways that are contrary to God, his heart and his honor, what is the win? God will not share his glory. Hear me, it's his. He owns it. He possesses it and he's not going to share it. And so if our hearts are competing in this, who gets glory, who gets the banner, who gets the allegiance, he won't share it. He'll knock down everything that competes with his glory. And this may surprise you. But Jesus didn't die for a nation. He didn't shed his blood for a nation. He ransomed men and women from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. From. That is, out of. He died for his people. He died for a church. We are the blood-bought people of Jesus, right? And he is our king. And so our allegiance has to increasingly be his and his alone. And where we discern divided allegiance, we should be grieved. We should be appalled. We should be outraged. The Bible does tell us when to be outraged. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, God says this, Be appalled, O heavens, 
at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have made for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that do not hold water. And so God here is telling us we should be outraged. We should be appalled as God's people when God's people forsake him and replace him. And I see it happening all over the American church. We are forsaking God and replacing God. We're finding our hope and we're finding our identity in all of these lesser things that may be good in and of themselves, but they, they, they're not God and they make themselves or they turn out to be miserable gods. Every single one of us is mastered by something. And Jesus is the only one that's good. So let's be mastered by him. Because he's good. You know, when, when, when uh, the nation of Israel is praying for a king, they look out and they see the way the other nations are acting. And, and maybe we would even understand they were safe and secure and prospering. Israel groaned for a king. And Samuel was upset over that. And God, God said, Samuel, don't, don't be upset. Don't take it personal because they have not rejected you. They have rejected me. They've rejected God. And then he says, now. Tell them they'll have their king and tell them this. And you go read through it over and over and over. Speaking of the king, it says, and he will take, and he will take, and he will take, and he will take, and he will take. And it's, it's a bit repetitive in case you didn't catch on. And they had Yahweh as their king already. And he doesn't take. He gives, and he gives, and he gives, and he gives. And he gives. And you will run out of need before he runs out of giving. But you will run out of your ability to give before that all those other masters run out of their desire to take. Jesus is good. And so when he calls us to be appalled and he calls us to be shocked, it's because we've rejected his good lordship. The goodness of his kingship. Well, again, this is where Habakkuk was. He was crying. He was screaming because a nation had rejected God. And so he voiced his concern. And then he received the word of the Lord, verse 5 through 11. So we read again, look among the nations, God says, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. That is, you got to see it to believe it. For behold, verse 6, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. That, that is, they're self-righteous. That's what he's getting at here. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press, on, press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an evil, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They all gather uh, captives like sand at kings. They scoff at rulers. They laugh. They laugh at every fortress. They pile up earth and they take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. God is saying to Habakkuk, I do care. You have been concerned that I don't care. Let me assure you that I do care. I'm already beginning to answer this cry for help, this cry for care. I'm at work in a way that you would not believe if you only heard about it. And so you've got to see this. It's interesting that God does not give an explanation, uh, an explanation of why. You don't find that here. You find an explanation of what. And we often want to know why. But God doesn't always tell us why, does he? So often he tells us what he's doing. Verse 5, I'm doing a work. Well, thank you. I mean, I guess we were starting to think you weren't working, but thank you for telling us. In verse 6, for behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. What he needed, what we need, when we begin to doubt God is not why but we need to know what, what this good and, and kind and, and patient God is doing. Because 
God cares more about the restored relationship than he cares about our full understanding of why he's acting. God is working in a way here to restore his people. He's bringing them to their senses in this work by raising up the Chaldeans. He's more concerned about your relationship with him than he is concerned with you understanding all that he's doing and why he's doing it. That changes the way he's going to act towards you and towards me. Because he has your heart in mind. He has you in mind. So he says, look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. This work is so incredible. Even the great prophet that served in the temple would not believe the word of the Lord unless he saw it with his own eyes. So he says, behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and that hasty nation who march through the, the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. And God is revealing right now the thing that's about to happen is he is going to discipline the nation of Judah by using a bitter and hasty people. That is a wicked and ruthless people. That Here they're called the Chaldeans. We also know them as the Babylonians. These were wicked, wicked people. Their only purpose of being so brutal and exercising their strength was just to impress people and say, we, we knew we could do it. it I and mean, look how the passage ends. Their own strength is their God. Verse 11. They were bullies. They were narcissistic bullies. They were idolaters and self-worship. They loved themselves. And what they loved most about themselves was their strength and their might. And so they didn't care who got in the way. They were going to flex their muscles. They were going to be bad. They were going to intimidate. They were, again, going to bully. One commentator summarizing 7 through 11, as this is described, said, Their horses had the speed of leopards and the ferocity of wolves, and their troops swooped down on their prey like vultures. Cultures. Their army swept across the desert like the wind and gathered and deported prisoners the way a man digs his hand into the sand and then ships it off to a foreign land. They didn't give a rip about anybody, what they thought. In fact, the language here is they would laugh. They laughed at other people putting up a fight. Not so much, but when my kids were little, I laughed at him a lot. <laughs> yeah, we can go play basketball. And you know, when I had height on him, I'd just swat the ball away. Jerk. <laughs> mean old dad. Did I tell you about the time I played my dad in ping pong? Happy Father's Day, Pop. <laughs> and he played me left-handed because I couldn't keep up. When he played me right-handed, he, 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 I couldn't keep up. And so he decided, but I didn't know this, he played me left-handed and I got way ahead of him. And all of a sudden, he made a big dramatic movement of moving the paddle from his left hand to his right. And he said, now let's play. And he smoked me. He let me feel good for a moment. Then he laughed at me. I don't think he's wicked in the, in the regard that the Babylonians were. But it's just one of these moments of, I'll let you toy around for a while. <laughs> You're so cute. Boom. And he destroyed. The Babylonians knew no one could do anything about them. At least they thought so. That is, no one but God. But what makes this so shocking is I just said what was true. Nobody could do anything about them because God was using them. That's the shock of this moment. God, righteous, holy God, had seen and heard the cry of Habakkuk because Habakkuk and God had seen the wickedness of the nation of Judah. And God's way of correcting that nation was taking a more wicked nation. Protecting them. Letting them rise in power. And then using them to judge his people. I almost started this sermon this way. God told me this week, 
that he was raising up Antifa to judge and discipline the American church. And not only that, God told me this week that God was raising up the Black Lives Matter organization to judge and discipline his church. So I want to ask you, what do you think if I say that? What would you say to me? God told me. Antifa is his agent to judge the church. Black Lives Matter, the movement, not the sentence, the movement, the, the, the organization. The reason they have a voice today is because God is using them to judge the church. What would you say to me? You'd probably scream and holler at me. You'd probably be shocked at such a statement. Because I, I mean, I was so uncomfortable I didn't want to lead with it because I thought it would just, everything else I'd say would be <laughs> misunderstood. But could you imagine God saying that to us? Could you imagine God saying the whole reason China has power today, the whole reason China is established is because I'm going to discipline my people? You'd say, what? They have no respect for, for life. All they know is abuse of authority, corruption, abounds. And you, righteous God, are going to use them? The whole reason they exist is you prospered them to judge us, to discipline us? You would probably say, no, there's no way. Welcome to Habakkuk's world. Welcome to 600 B.C. And I'm just simply saying, it's possible. I don't want to say it is the plan of God. I'm just saying it's possible that God is disciplining his people for being silent over things we should have never been silent about, for going along with the divorce culture, for going along and being silent with the abortion culture, right? For going along with, the, with all of the addiction. And we're looking to underhanded uh, philosophical practices for deliverance when we have a gospel and it is the power of God unto salvation. And we've just handed people out. We farm people out to these professional counselors who don't give a rip about Jesus. And we just sit back silent as if God has nothing to say about it. And we see our culture go from having a Judeo-Christian value system and being perverted and going the way of the world. And we just sat back silent. Maybe we've even gone along with them. If God used the wicked Babylonians to judge his less wicked Judean people, his people, it's possible that's what's happening today. But here's the key. Let's move from speculation to what we know. The point of all of this is God is saying, I do care. You thought I didn't care? No, 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 no. I do care. And I'm already at work addressing the thing that grieves you. I'm already at work confronting the sins of Judah. And I'm going to do something about it. The Lord was going to discipline them. Because the Lord does care for them. We learn in Hebrews, the one without discipline proves not to belong to God. But discipline shows the love of God. And discipline produces the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. So if we're not being disciplined by God, then we don't belong to him. And if his discipline in our lives is not producing the peaceful fruit of righteousness, then we don't belong to him. I think, I think we're like Habakkuk in that when we pray to the Lord because of the chaos in our nation or the chaos in our community or whatever it is, we expect like a, a relief, an immediate help and protection. I think Habakkuk, like, like we are today, would be praying for revival. When he's crying, how long? I think he's saying, send a great revival to my soul. <laughs> But that's not what God did. I think he's praying like we are that God would judge evil and that God would, 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 would remove wicked leaders. 
I think he was praying like we are that God would establish righteousness and end all injustice. But these people had been warned over and over and over again of the consequence of testing God and the consequence of living in sin, but they had refused to listen to the clear word of God. And they had tested God long enough. His patience was done for this moment of time, and he's now going to act. And we've got to know. We've got to remember God hates sin. All sin. Uh, even the sins that we find no big deal. Those respectable sins. He does take notice. He is addressing sin. Judah probably thought they got away with it. 722 BC, the 10 northern tribes of Israel were driven into exile, scattered, never to be returned. And we're about 120 years after that time. And it's possible they thought, whew, God, I thank you, I'm not like Israel. They got away with it. And God is saying, no. You didn't. It's your turn now. And we know from history in 586, the two southern tribes were driven into exile by the Chaldeans, by the Babylonians. Listen, God hates sin and God deals with sin. So if you or I or we think willful sin or even indifference to sin has gone unnoticed, no. God was not overlooking and dismissing and saying it's no big deal. And he's not doing that today. He was overlooking for a moment. And we'll see that. But he was keeping a record of sin. And he still is. So then we should be appalled. We should be outraged. That we don't grieve sin. But we grieve our beloved nation being driven into ruin by corrupt people. And we wave our flags and our message so high, proudly. And we shirk back from giving winsome testimony to the glory of God in Christ. Be appalled. Grieve. Repent. Hate the silence of the people of God. So when we think God doesn't care, even though his actions shock us, remember he does care and he is acting. He does care. He is noting. I don't know if your heart does what my heart does, but I'm very similar to Habakkuk in that he took some truth about God and he misapplied it. He took truths like God is holy and righteous and just. And therefore he interpreted the silence as maybe he's not. Why am I having to cry out like this if you're holy and righteous and just? So he's taking a truth about God and drawing some not true conclusions. Do you ever do that? I think the most common that I hear today in the American uh, conversation is if God is good and loving... No, they would say, since God is good and loving, there's no way he created a hell or would send anybody there. That's not what a good and loving God would ever do. And if you're saying hell is real, then I'm saying God's not real. That's how this works. You ever do that? You take a, a truth about God, but then misapply it or draw a, a, the wrong implication from it. That's what Habakkuk was doing, and that's what we may do. God is righteous, holy, and he hates sins. Therefore, he would never use a wicked nation like Babylon, like Black Lives Matter, like Antifa, or like you just name it, whatever it is that offends you so deeply. He would never do that. Well, maybe. We see here he did. What we need to remember is our place. <laughs> God is in heaven and we are here on earth. Therefore, we should let our words be few. God is God and his ways are higher than our ways. And he doesn't answer to man. 
Our calling is not to call God into question and demand an answer out of Him. Our calling is to humbly trust Him, to submit to Him. By faith, we follow Him. We know Him to be good. We know Him to be loving. We know Him to be wise. Therefore, even as Charles Spurgeon said, when you cannot trace trace His hand, you trust His heart. You don't call God into question. You trust Him. You say, I don't understand, but I trust you, God. So voice your concern. Cry. Cry. Pray for our nation. Yes. Pray for God's holiness. Yes. Pray for the politicians. That's what the Bible tells us to do. But don't give in to underhanded practices in how we address these issues. But walk in the Spirit. And then you will not display the deeds of the flesh. Do you find this shocking? I'm sure I've said something today that was shocking. (laughs) What I want to know specifically is, do you find the Bible shocking? If not, then please go back. I understand I am a a frail, uh, hasty, unclear preacher more often than not. But go back and ask the Lord, To show you what's really there. Ask the Lord to renew your heart. Because here's the implication. Here's why I want to ask, do you find it shocking? If you don't find Habakkuk chapter 1 shocking, I don't know how you would ever find the gospel shocking. Did you know this passage here is quoted in Acts chapter 13? When Paul is preaching the gospel. And and he's saying, uh, basically, don't harden your hearts to this message here. God has already given us a a type, a shadow, a glimpse of this great work of Christ. He gave it to us through Habakkuk. That he was doing such an incredible work that if you didn't see it with your own eyes, you would never believe it. And Paul is reasoning with them now and saying to them... Listen, you think Habakkuk, you guys are agreeing with Habakkuk that it was truly shocking that God would use this wicked nation to judge his less less wicked people. You find that shocking? That's nothing compared to Jesus being crucified by wicked Pilate. Acts 13, 28. uh, Though they found in him, in Jesus, though they found in him, no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. That comes right on the, or just before Paul quotes Habakkuk 1.5. God orchestrated. God worked in a way that Pilate was brought to power. And God used wicked Pilate to judge his pure and holy and righteous son. Have you lost the shock of our gospel? You know we have more in common by nature with the radical anarchist than we do Jesus Christ. You know that. We have more in common by nature with the most wicked, perverted heart that's ever walked the face of the earth. We have more in common with that individual than we do with Jesus by nature. We're closer to that wicked person than we are to Jesus by nature. There's a great gulf between God and man. So be appalled. Be shocked. I am doing something in your days that if you would, uh, that if you would not, you would not believe it if only told about it. Just insert there for behold, I am raising up wicked Pilate, that bitter, that hasty man to judge my one and only son. Why would he do that? You ready? For you. For you. That's, that's his love. For you. 
in your place, condemned he stood. Judah had sins to pay for. Christ didn't. But in his great love, he traded places with us. So, friends, at the end of the day, there's only two types of people with only two outcomes. Those that know Christ and those who don't. And those that are going to join him, resting and worshiping him forever, and those that will perish forever. That's our message. That's our charter. And it's bought with the blood of Jesus, and the gates of hell will not overcome that. So nations will rise and fall, but the church will endure forever. And I'm simply saying, in this moment of time, yes, let's be outraged over the right thing. And let's weep and let's grieve over the right thing. And let's take that grief to the Lord. And let's just be quiet and receive the word of the Lord. We're going to be okay. But not just okay. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. We may limp now. But one day, we'll be whole. And we will run and run and run and run. And one day we may, or, and today we may weep while we sing. But there's a day coming where we will not weep again. We doubt one another now. We're skeptical. But there's a day coming when we truly will know that love believes all things. We'll believe one another. We'll, we'll love loving one another. It won't be hard. It won't be hard. It's blood-bought. It's guaranteed. It's already ours. We're tasting the first fruits of it. Let's trust him for more. Let's remember our greatest problem has already been addressed at the cross. And when we begin to wrestle, when we begin to wonder, does he care? Is he working? Let's remember the cross and the empty tomb guarantee it's finished. It's only a matter of time, brothers and sisters. So let's now run with endurance.